everyone. Good evening. Welcome to this wonderful evening launch for Nina Mingya Powell's book, Magnolia Mulan, which I'm absolutely delighted to be launching here um, with Nine Arches Press. I am Jen Kamein, editor at Nine Arches Press, and we have a wonderful evening of poetry ready for you tonight. Hello to everybody watching us on YouTube. We're absolutely delighted that you can all join us. And I'm absolutely thrilled as well that we have a wonderful lineup of poets reading with us tonight. I'm absolutely delighted to have special guests, J.G. Ying, Victoria Adukwe Bully, and Patricia reading with Nina Mingya Pals this evening. So without further ado, um, I'm absolutely delighted to begin the evening um, with some guest readers. And just to let you know as well, we'll be um, running through our readers. Victoria Adjikwe Bully will be reading first, followed by Patricia, followed by Jay and then we'll have a reading from Nina. We will be inviting people who are watching live with us on YouTube to ask um, a question, a short Q&A um, at the very end, and then Nina will read one last poem to send us off into the evening. Um, but first of all, say a huge thank you to everybody joining us. These are strange times, and um, who would have thought that we would be here launching and hosting wonderful poetry events online instead of in real life. Tonight, we should have been at the Poetry Cafe in London. But I'm really delighted and very thankful to, to our special guests for joining us, and also to Nina for also joining us online for this wonderful celebration of her book. So thank you very much for being with us digitally and virtually in this space tonight. It's an absolute delight to be with you and thank you for joining us to celebrate this wonderful collection of poems. So to um, then move on to our first reader for this evening, I'm absolutely delighted to be wel welcoming Victoria Adukwe Bully. Victoria is a poet, a writer and filmmaker. She is winner of an Eric Gregory Award and the recipient of a 2019 Techne Doctoral Scholarship for Practice-Based Research in Creative Writing at Royal Holloway University of London. She's also an absolutely incredible poet and somebody who I enjoyed very much seeing read a couple of years ago at Verth as part of the showcase that took place there um, in Birmingham at the festival and also at Ledbury. So I know that you're in for an absolute delight tonight in hearing Victoria read. So we Will you please welcome for our reader tonight, our first reader, Victoria Adukwe Bully. Thank you. There we go. Hi everyone. Um, this is um, this is really lovely. I think um, it's it's weird that going out is now going online, um, but it's it's wonderful to do this for Nina and um, her amazing new book, which I get to hold now. Um, it's such a joy to um, be part of bringing the book out into the world. And I'm just so excited um, about so much of the stuff that Nina's doing even beyond poetry. I think it's really inspirational. Um, her output and how creative she is in so many different ways, whether it's food or um, prose, writing, poetry, um, making things. I feel like she's so prolific um, in a creative way. Um, so yeah, I'm very grateful to be part of this. Uh, so I'll just read four poems, a bit of a mix of old and new and um, yeah. So I'll start. About Anna. The truth is, nobody knows how Anna Mendieta met her death. It would appear she was pushed. Some distance below, the doorman said he heard a woman shout no, and then the sound as her body hit the top of the diner so hard her face left a mark like a postage stamp. In the photo, she is naked and feathered. She looks like the first woman, like she doesn't know what a camera is, that somewhere in the world, it is believed that these things can steal a soul. Her arms are out as if to say, you move them like this to fly, like this. See, her feet are apart. You can see the sphere of her hips, 
the delta between her legs. I look at her and think, this is the true work of the body, to adorn itself and be comfortable, unaware. I, myself, am bored of fig leaves, of shames that I did not choose. By the way, if you see me looking around, there is a cat in here and um, I'm not responsible for him. So <laughs> if anything happens, it's his fault. Maybe he'll make an appearance. Um, um, read, there we go, okay. What it means. The campus nurse offers up pills like penny sweets means it when she says it's just one less thing to worry about. That's okay. There are many freedoms. In the first world, freedom from bloodshed is tasted between the legs. I don't judge. How would she know that I have come to love the cup spilling over the floor of the bath, a Rothko on fiberglass, an opening ceremony, a private showing circa this month. There is nothing like knowing I am an orchestra only rehearsing. You whose name means honey. You are Beautiful to me, you are beautiful to me across the table we have arrived at, in from the rain. No makeup on your face, but for the small, frail thread of something on your right cheek that I would like to remove for you, you whose name means honey. Every time you look up and it is still there, I would like to be the one who says, hold on, come here, let me, one minute, stay there, almost, there we go, all done, perfect. And when you look up and it is gone, swept absentmindedly off the face of the earth by your dark hair, oh, I am sad to have missed my chance. And I'll end with, I'll end with a new one. Here we go, I'll end with this one, which is part of a series um, that was started sort of in February when we were going into lockdown um, amidst that kind of emotional climate. COVID-19 versus Black Folk, poem number three, with a line from Lucille Clifton. We hug first and remember second. Arms are thrown about backs. Fingers gesture towards hair, admiring a careful day's work of braids. Cue laughter as usual, cue knowing smiles. And what is it that we feel beneath all this? that gives our meetings their sugared ease. Not denial quite, not humor to evade dissemblance this time. The body keeps a logbook of what happens to it. Bones speak long after the flesh has gone. Often on the train, the one seat that's free is the one that's next to me and that's just fine. You know a girl likes a space to place her bag. Maybe social distancing is another way of saying that. Yes, when I walk into a room, I never know what I might do. In this skin, sis, I am a virus too. So that's it from me. And um, I want to say thank you again, Nina, for having me and um, happy birthday uh, to this amazing 
um, piece of work and I hope you feel so proud as as you should and um, yeah I'm I feel happy for you and incredibly impressed and always so in awe of what you do so thank you for having me here it's an honor mm -hmm. thank you thank you so much Victoria for that beautiful reading as well that was stunning and that last poem your final poem um is just really breathtaking thank you for reading that um it's been lovely to have you as one of our guests and our next guest will be Pratusha to tell you a little bit about Pratusha I've been um, really enjoying the fabulous pamphlet, Bull Bull Calling, which she has just published with Bitter Melon Press, of which uh, Nina Mingya Pals is editor um, in 2020. It's a really beautifully produced pamphlet with the most extraordinary illustrations with it. So I do urge you, if you are a fan of poetry pamphlets, to check it out. It also contains a, a really very wonderful um, um, gazal or guzzle, um, which I, I very much enjoyed, so do recommend it. Patricia is an Indo-Swiss writer. Um, she has the pamphlet Bulbul Calling from Bitter Melon Press and she co-edits Amber Flora. Will you please welcome Pratusha. Thank you very much. Our next guest. Hi, thank you so much for having me here at Nine Arches. It's really exciting and also to be reading for Nina's book is, is incredible. Um, I got my copy pretty early. I was just jumping on the pre-order button. And um, I also got the beautiful print that came with it. And I've hung that up in, in my bedroom. Um, I just think it's, it's one of the most extraordinary poetry collections I've read. It's so lyrical, but so kind of enmeshed in, you know, the, the details of everyday life. And I found the, the way it kind of balances itself between story and, and these very like fine details, really interesting. And Nina has, has been a great friend, a great editor and publisher. Um, she's published Bubble Calling with me, which was really exciting. And I was, I was thrilled to kind of be able to do this with my grandmother as well. Um, my, my grandmother did the illustrations for the cover and inside as well. And Nina helped, you know, put it all together, chose the paper, beautiful paper and the inks and printed at home. So it's really exciting to be able to do this and thank you so much for, for having me. So I'm gonna start with a poem called Aversion. My grandmother is puzzled by the stories I choose to fixate on in the Mahabharatam. Ganga story, for instance, I keep asking, she drowned her multitude of sons, sons? I'm fascinated by Ganga because she is both river and island. Not even Shantanu has a window to her inner life. He tells her, I love you. I ask no questions. And his presence withdraws into a small point in the fixed perspective of her peripheral vision. Who is the story really about? The sun sink into wave foam, pulling currents from their long hair swallowing dead leaves, the ashes of corpses, washed and cut glass, the sharp edges of twigs, and bruised their tongues purple from the overabundance of silt, salt, their hair bridled with a night's quiet stare, their eyes full of a blurred plurality and searching for something to drink. She is more singular. She waits for her fate, the silken texture of inevitability brushing her ankles. It all comes to a slow end, she thinks, and the conditions she's imposed. At night, she swims silently, gliding over the sediment, listening to the sangi murmur, and she cannot both wash away the grief and contain it within this flowing body, a river of blood, her face obliterated by water. She hears dully the forest's shadow call, the twisting tendrils of the air, carrying with them the responsibility of a war to come. I hear her on a sleepless, half-crazed night in March, a continent away from where her body still adamantly flows 
carrying now the vestiges of plastic along with her children's ashes, cigarettes, posters turning back into tree, her voice fogged with pollution's hot veil. My grandmother gives me a shell because I should keep the water with me. I hold it to my ear. In feverish delirium, I hear faint echoes. Once I asked not to be questioned, dreamed of becoming heir. Every year I drank, I did not answer. Today I hold my own body choked with dirt. Where do I wash myself? Um, I'll also read separation. Intangible hyphenation. Growing in the stretch of grass between two farms. Paused, the body angled taut, thawing darkness. Along the Rhine, I found both tongue and apparition. Unbeständig. Where is the absence marked? Where does the first drowning begin? Overreaching, always, the body's solitary reasoning, embodied faltering, Dreilande Ecke, partitioned, transitioned, irrevocably divided, Venus in retrograde, this always displacement, this Heimat, this resilience of storks standing in the soft white fog of February mornings, this Shabnam, tidal fields, a basal dew lake, a catching place, der Nebel, suspension, and revelation, relearning childhood rivers, dark and seamed, watering dreams, both cartographies and die Lehre. Um, heat wave. Daisies open in the late summer. They caramelize in the heat. The heat wave sits heavy on my eyelids. It accumulates vertigo territorial depression, pressure shot through the day, the light turning on the still point of a pedal, the economy falling through light. Predictions for this fiscal year, deflation. We squabble over dinner, dissatisfaction hangs like a vapor. I'm writing for you, I'm forgetting everything. Assimilation is an empty field. What is it or what was it? Earthquake impact registering 6.2 on the Richter scale. How much, how much again? They threw an effigy into the sea. They said it was for prayer. I forget her face. I threw its memory over water. There was a brief tremor. My neighbor has an oleander plant. I pick up its fallen starry petals. A poison flower, bright and pink, like the sky late at night. It is toxic in all its parts, but it produces no poison nectar. The poison heat from oleander, after dark, one can sense a faint narcotic smoke, rises into the night, twining itself around the cherry tree and falling back into the peonies. All at once they wither. What are you doing out there? It's late, come inside, watch for mosquitoes. Dreaming leaves me uncertain, a little nauseous. Drink rose water before you sleep, cautions my grandmother. Nothing happens, not even perfuming inside my dreams. Instead, I dream of huge floods, an Amsterdam townhouse floating sideways in a river that breaks its banks at sunrise, a copy of Bloomberg magazine lying on a stray island, words sliding off the page, stock markets erased. Wake up, wake up, it's nearly noon. Even the roads smoke these days. We shade our eyes before starting out on parched late afternoon walks, a bottle of rum in her hand, a borrowed book in mine. The hair on my legs sizzles. I don't think we should go out today, she says, her face slightly crimson. I give her my hat. We fall asleep over our book and drink. There is a faint tremor. My mother pulls my braid tight. My scalp itches, glows with attention. It's a fierce pull, nearly feral. I don't ask her why she's angry. Perhaps it's better unsaid. Another robbery in the neighborhood. They're getting brazen now. 
The dogs are too sleepy in this heat to do anything, even bark. Porosity in the summer. Skin opens to air, but the air is wordless. And finally, I'm gonna read immersion. Dissolving, textured string and part garment. Here, the final gnaw, the moving fall, unweaving my threads from this pain, your shadow like a phantom on the wall. In the silence sits a human sadness through which I journey still imprisoned, a night's pristine light desiccating its small shower across my face, the privacy for bruise. Quiet grief, he is with me, his cold hair, his lingering breaths brushing tendrils. In the wet darkness, a green current enters the room. Eyes of the rain open and alive, searching. Invincible light streaming through bone, she said, white heat for healing, perforated body shedding its rind, transforming into belief, a heartbeat and then leaves, leaves, leaves. The dark preserves translucency, allows me to walk barefoot, pry apart the oblique for these damp roots, for this immersion. That's all for me, but thank you so much. Um, thanks again, Nina, and I'm really excited to hear Jay read. Thanks, Victoria, for reading. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Patricia, for reading. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, and I should also mention um, your Bitter Melon pamphlet. We have just posted a link in our comment section. So anybody who wants to buy that from Bitter Melon um, can do so. And another poet, our next poet, our next guest, J.G. Ying, is also a fellow Bitter Melon publishing poet as well. I think Nina's been doing fantastic things. And just to say, the, the way that those pamphlets are produced, they are really beautiful, handmade, hand-printed, very special edition pamphlets. So they're real delights and they're something that um, is, is really quite beautiful. So um, thank you, Nina, for making those beautiful pamphlets as well. Um, as I was saying, J.G. Ying, our next poet, is also um, published by... Bitter Melon. His pamphlet Wedding Beasts was published last year. He also has another collection, Catabasis. Um, he's a writer, critic and translator based in Edinburgh and in 2019 was winner of the New Poets Prize with the poetry business. And um, he's also a contributing editor at White Review. Catabasis is one of the New Poets Prize collections um, published by the poetry business. And it's been described by Mary Jean Chan as a collection to be savoured repeatedly. And by Will Harris as a collection that is at once spectral and vivid, timeless and current. These broken rhythms and stalled narratives attempt to shift through the wreckage of war and argue back to it. It's a really powerful and incredible collection of poems. So I do urge you, um, if you don't have that, to uh, order both the Bitter Melon um, publication of J.G. Ying's book, um, pamphlet, sorry, and also the one from Poetry Business. Um, would you please give a warm welcome to our final guest reader for this evening, J.G. Ying. Thank you. Hi there, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be here today to be celebrating Nina's great book. Um, I have a copy here, but I wanted to actually go one step further and make it in my background, but it didn't really work out so well. It's a bit janky, um, but it's a great book nonetheless. <clears throat> um, the first poem I'm going to read is called Endymion. Our foolish cruise sets a haunted course. Five lakes four seas xiao xiang. I tour my grave on an island where bamboo is hardened from the porthole moon. Did I dream of your desire last night? Did the imperial ghost ship glide in like a video? A boy transforms into the wife of a dragon king. Was that shadow on the dying lake bed eight sights of your body? Last wild geese descends to the sand. Rain on the lake, the temple bell the dirtied snow, mist that clears, a village glows. Our own old moon in autumn, lone sail homewards bound, looking out, 
my memories of those inert evenings feel barely celestial. Two clangs of a pavilion gong as a joyous fire forever passes over. Um, I've been writing a lot of sort of travel poems, even though I've done no traveling. Um, so it's more sort of, I guess, poems about dreams and, and fantasies, I guess. And the next one is called Rest and Relaxation. We agreed to let time off, to give it up, spend a month or two in his inherited villa. I pressed my ear to his family's old lipped tiles and heard tomorrow pass. Heaven yawns and the spider plants flush limp before dying. By the blue cliffs, we were never followed into those marvelous early hours of nothing. Nobody caught those interlopers. Through the benthic rain, I miss here a voice that sounds like his, reciting my last name dreamily. In reality, every one-eyed star of Bethlehem swelled from the toxic water and minerals in the pipes. He told me he had once tried to end his life here. He asked if he could show me. I looked back in time and saw him by the naked Judas tree, pulling out those weeds and roots and tears, armies of pink flowers closing in, ending their chemical ballet, violent memories blotting beyond that mortal realm. I undressed his cold, wet body as I might pluck the synthetic petals off his nation's land. I never meant our eyes to fall on the same wound in the horizon an archipelago translated by its own distress, a blush flag, its colonized tricolor, the viper writhing in the monochromatic wind or bed linen. Go back to sleep, I asked of him. His car alarm detonated not far from the hippogeum, ringing out the gulls guarded the tourist tombs with Roker's invocation. There were many quiet, rigid rules for death. And I heard him choose to play pretend, breathe through each for both of us, as we slept back to back, touching like rare metals. Outside the town slid into its own catastrophes, the whitewashed pumice became smooth from the cloying acid rain. An endangered moth alighted silently, ready for its annihilation. Two spotted lizards scurried across without trial, as blank as a pair of trick dice. Um, Death old. Did you know I left all my slippery wet miniatures on a washing machine lid? Those travel sized bottles like toy soldiers I will have to scoop up in the morning. I clutched my dirty clothes to my chest like a bouquet of limbs in last night's dream. I was a child lost in that hallway again. I was a newly sewn doll longing to be filled up with sand. On a branch I saw three apples made of metal waiting to mutate. A bruise the size of an eye leading to rust the size of my country. And the final poem I'm gonna to read tonight, before we move on to the wonderful Nina, I'm gonna read out um, something new, which is a bit sort of rough. It's called, The Tourist Tries to Write a High Bun. You toured the last house in that null zone blinked across the fringes of that abandoned land like a last storm. In the park, every stroke of graffiti sounded like one unfinished greeting. You sieved through the charred colored glass of the shop slash library to uncover a topsoil of bullet cases. You hid those carcasses from the lingering soldiers and their metal detectors, a couple more mementos. Bury one in ash from a plot of cemetery irises, line another on a chest of toys like a last monument. Wrap them up in some loosened silk, 
or bloodied cotton wool, the foam torn from a couch left out on the road, a living room which no longer exists, and you never even noticed, even after returning to that herd that you left the gift behind, you must have done it so carelessly without even thinking. You wonder whether you can ever go back there, retrace every step there, like looking through duplicate photographs you never meant to shoot and march in circles just to find out what was lost in the first place. By then, the day was already over. The coach picked all of you up from your promised point of origin. You had allowed yourself to wander off only to return just in time. One hand reaches out to shut the slats of the AC above your head. Your other hand grips the bag of souvenirs tightly. The camera in your mind feels like ice. And you think the librarian may have ripped you off. Twilight, all the roads transformed into tracks. You dream this trip will never end. The coach is always so relentless. And before you go to bed that night, back in the sanctuary of the hotel on a notepad moonlight, uh, moonlighting as a temporary diary, you might write something like, seasons of hot rain, scab out the translations in a tome of old poems. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay. Thank you for that wonderful reading. And it's always such a pleasure to hear new poems as well. It always feels a real privilege to, to hear those. Um, so thank you very much for sharing those with us this evening. And can I just say a special thank you to all of our guests, to Jay, to Patricia and to Victoria for joining us in this lovely celebration this evening and for sharing your poems. It's been lovely to have you as part of this event reading for us. So thank you very much. Um, there will be links posted in the chat for anyone who's interested in buying those books or in buying Magnolia so do keep an eye on that and um, click on those if you're interested in buying the books as well. Um, so our um, reader, our final reader for this evening is Nina Mingya Powells and it's a real delight to be publishing Magnolia Mulan and to have worked with Nina over the last um, year or so and to get to know her poems and to get to know her and to have worked on this book. I'm very very proud that Nine Arches has published Magnolia and that fantastic cover as well by Kerry Ann Lee um, which for which many thanks Nina for um, for choosing it's just so beautiful um thank you um i just wanted to say a few words really about um the process of working on the book and about the poems um and it's been such a such an interesting journey and it's so wonderful to have seen the book already gaining many many new readers who are reading it and adoring it and sharing um in their pleasure of the poems with us online um so to say really that I think that um, Magnolia Mulan um, arrived as a manuscript and was really irresistible for so many reasons for me as an editor, um, not least that it has something very distinctive and multifaceted about it. I think the way that Nina has constructed this book, almost like a journal, and it encompasses so many elements of ourselves that explore the idea of who we are also where we're from or where we're heading to or where we're going so all of those things are drawn into this book in such beautiful detail um, Nina writes about mixed race girlhood memory food and place and these poems have a sort of hungry heart and a sense of longing threaded through them whether that's falling through the rain in Shanghai or rising from the steam of a delicious meal this is a book shot through also with colour and vibrancy and the variety of nature because Nina is a fantastic writer of the natural world. She really gets in and engages with the sensuous nature of things, the actual tactile nature of things too, and writes so beautifully in terms of describing and bringing to life um, both nature and 
the natural world of animals and plants and places for us, but also the human too. And whether that's in describing the shades of skill, silk and lantern lights of some of the poems and the way that they engage with every way in which colour affects us as humans. And these are sort of mouthwatering poems as well. It's hard to read Magnolia and not feel um, a hunger in some form, whether that's a hunger for, for place or travel or for home or for food or for memory, because I think all so memory is a really key form um, within all of these poems. But also to say, I think these are really robust poems. And we were just saying before we um, finished um, our conversation tonight, before we started the launch, um, what a joy it's been to actually typeset this book as well. Um, I've really enjoyed working with the forms and shapes of Nina's poems. They are really strident and thoughtful in how they use the page. So it's been a complete pleasure um, for me as an editor to work on those. And always, I think Nina's great skill in the illuminating care she takes with each word, with each poem, with the way that language is used. It's a revealing use of language often. It's all about how things are named or find their names. Um, there's an irresistible song then at the heart of the poems that is both radical and nourishing and evocative. It's such a wonderful collection, Nina, and Nine Arches Press are really delighted to have published your book, um, Magnolia Mulan, and we're so thrilled tonight to be launching it. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you to ask you to read. At the end of the reading, we'll take a Q&A as well. So please do um, add your questions into the chat if you'd like to. And um, I may also kick off by asking a question, but allow me to introduce Nina Mingya Pals. Well, um, thank you so much, Jane. Um, it's so strange not to be in the same room as all of you, but also it was quite magical to just like sit in this quiet room listening to your words. It was really amazing, especially not having seen you for like half a year or more. Um, and it's strange to be launching the book this way, but there's like double the number of people um, watching right now than we could have actually fit into the Poetry Cafe. So that's quite amazing. Um, thank you so much for your words, uh, Victoria, Patricia and Jay. Um, I think all of you have been really inspiring and supportive to me in various ways, um, both like in a poetic way, and just in life <laughs> um, over the last couple of years. So it had a real influence on me, I think, in the time that um, Magnolia was coming together. So thank you for joining. Um, and especially thank you, Jane and Angela as well at Nine Arches for your care in putting the book together, which is so gorgeous and pink and um, I love it so much, I can't stop touching it. It's really beautiful on the inside and the outside. Um, so thank you so much, Jane. Um, okay, I'll read a few poems um, and then maybe answer some questions. Um, okay, so this one I've never read. Um, it's a Wellington poem. Last summer we were underwater. Last summer we were underwater and we asked, what are you doing there, moon? Our bodies neck deep in salt and rain. Each crater is a sea, you said, and dived under the sun. Before I could speak, water rushing over your skin, the place where chocolate ice cream had melted and dried there like a newly formed freckle on the surface of us. And the islands crumbling apart softly over sea caves somewhere opening my mouth into the waves to say, you are, you are, you are. Um, this poem flicks back to London, where I am now, obviously. Um, this one, the title, Far Away Love, is the title of a painting 
by Agnes Martin. Um, and the painting itself, I happened upon it at the Tate one day, um, on one of my, I think in my first few weeks of living in London. So it had quite an impression on me. And if you don't know her work, um, her paintings are really simple, beautiful, big canvases, usually square with pastel colors and grid lines and like geometric uh, shapes. Far away love. Far away love is a five foot square overpainted in light blue wavering. Far away love is made of layers of white. Subsequent layers peel away, revealing luminous air. Far away love is where blue escapes under the lines. Far away love is a reversal of the traditional notions of work. Far away love is floating across a pale field beneath a particular hue of sky. Far away love is strong, persistently irregular. It has a hand-drawn quality, an imperfect line traced across the surface. Far away love is translucent in the desert. Far away love is present in light reflecting segments into which she pressed lengths of shuddering, some fingerprints still visible. Um, I thought I'd read an excerpt from a kind of long prose poem or maybe poem essay that Jane let me keep in the book, even though it's like the most um, kind of sneaky essay. <laughs> um, and it's about Shanghai and a writer who lived there called Eileen Chang or Zhang Eileen. Um, she was very famous in the 1920s and 30s and she wrote lots of short stories set in Hong Kong and Shanghai. Um, and I'm, I often write about um, other women artists and writers um, and yeah, Falling City. The apartment building where the writer Eileen Chang lived in Shanghai stands at 195 Changde Lu at the corner of Nanjing Xi Lu. I found it one day at the beginning of spring, a month after I arrived in the city to learn Chinese. The women in her stories are not always likable. They are selfish, bored, cruel, petty, trapped in stuffy apartments and unhappy marriages. Shanghai traps its inhabitants easily with spring rain that pours unendingly, summer humidity that smothers, drains. One night in June, my electricity runs out at 3 a.m shutting off my air conditioning. I get out of bed and lie on the tiled floor, damp hair fanned out above my head, fingers spread out, not touching any part of my body. Every few minutes I shift onto a cooler part of the floor that my skin has not yet made contact with. I drift in and out of sleep. A colloquial word for humid is men, which can also mean bored, depressed, or tightly sealed. The character is made up of a heart inside a door. I think of the woman in Chang City, their curled hair frizzing in the heat, a halo of light around their heads. They sit by the window in dark bedrooms and hotel rooms awake while everyone else is asleep, in silk chung sums and cotton slippers with flowers embroidered on the toes. City of dimly lit windows and half open doors. City of smoke moving through still air. City of trapped hearts.
Uh, okay, um, the next one is also a Shanghai poem. Um, when I lived there a few years ago, I would often go to the movies by myself. Um, and this came out of uh, one of those occasions of going to see a movie that I wouldn't normally, but um, tickets were really cheap and it was a thing that I like to do. So this one um, is about a movie directed by Zhang Yimou. Uh, that came out in 2016. The Great Wall. When Matt Damon saved China by driving his spear into the alien's mouth, I was distracted by Lin May's long braided hair and the way she holds herself so still, ready to strike down her enemies with a knife in each fist. But some things are fixed in the white savior narrative, like the exotic love interest who will risk everything as ancient cities crumble around her. And when you asked me what I thought afterwards in the autumn rain, I wanted to say some parts were beautiful, like the pagoda of iridescent glass shattering into pieces of pink and blue light, just as Lin Mei lets loose her arrow. And also when you whispered something in my ear and I was hit by the shockwave caused by my body and your breath existing in the same moment in the same universe. Months later, you told me you cried during Rogue One, the scene where two men hold each other, weeping beneath the palm trees, blasting the leaves apart and their hands shaking moments before a star-destroying weapon obliterates their small, wrecked portion of universe. I didn't know what to do with these space opera feelings, only that I had to exit this particular narrative in which our knees are just touching and we are laughing while the city disappears around us, as if we could reach back through hyperspace to touch the silver holograms of our past selves, as if we could go back to some other time on some other planet, before the first particles of energy let go of themselves, like the thousand paper lanterns released into the sky above the Great Wall, a thousand tiny fires trapped inside. Only the second time I've ever read from the actual book. I'm still getting used to where the poems are. Um, this one, um, I wrote, it, it, um, it's a poem that happened quite quickly when I was listening through most of the night um, to the radio after there'd been quite a big earthquake in New Zealand and I was in China. Um, luckily everything was fine, but there was a tsunami warning um, and I was like listening to the tsunami updates in my room in Shanghai. And um, so some of these lines are from those words that I was hearing. The first wave. They request that we inform you immediately. You are standing on soft ground. The ceiling lights are swinging in the background. The waves crash, then dissipate. The first wave may not be the largest. This is a flow on event, so do not go near. Do not stay and watch the land slipping. It has triggered other faults like a network of nerves and the seabed has risen out of the sea. There are visible ruptures running along the landscape. This is a flow on event, but the moon does not cause earthquakes. The ceiling lights are a typical pattern of aftershocks and they request that we inform you, you are a visible rupture running along the landscape. Do not stay and watch your nerves slipping. There will be strong currents in the background 
the moon has risen out of the sea. The first wave crashes, then dissipates. You are standing on such soft ground. And um, for now, I'll end on one poem, which is the first poem in the book. Girl Warrior, or watching Mulan 1998 in Chinese with English subtitles. I had to put the 1998 in later because I thought that I would be like reading these poems after the new Mulan came out. But now it's like none of us have seen that. And so there's none of that confusion. <laughs> um, but yeah, that will be good. When it does come out, a lot of us should go and see it together. Um, Girl Warrior, one. I remember the sound the sword made when she cut off all her hair. A sound like my mother cutting fabric, those blue scissors clutched in her small hands. I remember wondering why she didn't cut from the roots. A Disney princess kneeling in the smoke colored dark with straight hair, thin waists, hardly any breasts. Unlike me with my thick legs and too much hair that doesn't stay. Why don't we cut it short, she said, and so we did. But soon it curled sideways, ungracefully caught in the wind of some perpetual hurricane. When I watch Mulan in Chinese with English subtitles, I understand only some of the words. My focus shifts to certain details, how Mulan drags a very large cannon across the snow with very small wrists, how the villain has skin as dark as coal and such small eyes he has no irises. Once a guy told me mixed girls are the most beautiful because they aren't really white, but they aren't really Asian either. After Mulan saves China, fireworks rain down in waves of multicolored stars. You fight pretty good, says her boyfriend with the big American arms. I have small victories too, being kind to my body for one day, not checking my phone for your texts walking home alone at night and not feeling lonely. Why don't you ever write about yourself? And I didn't know why either. In Chinese, one word can lead you out of the dark, then back into it in a single breath. Shut off the light, as my mother and other Chinese mothers say. Now open it. When Mulan returns home, the colors change from gray, blue, green to pink, warm, yellow. There are plum blossoms floating in the stream. Her hair is still a little messy to make sure we don't forget. She used to be something else. When summer ended, rain poured off the edge of elevated highways and washed away the moon. I no longer have a sword, but sometimes at night I hold my keys between my fingers. I paint my lips. I draw avalanches. I light fires inside dream palaces. I cut my hair over the bathroom sink. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nina. Um, what a wonderful reading. It was really wonderful to hear those poems and to celebrate with you by having um, such a wonderful reading from the poetry book from Magnolia Mulan. Um, we are going to take a short break for a few questions. And then if I could invite you to read one final poem for us this evening, that'd be wonderful. I'll also bring back all of our guests as well. So we can all give you um, a resounding round of applause um, virtually online um, from all of our various front rooms. We'd, we'd love to do that um, and I should mention too as well that um, this book will also be published in New Zealand and Australia um, by Seraph Press won't it um, later this year as well so if there are any viewers um, currently in those countries who are um, looking forward to, to purchasing it that it will be available from Seraph um, I think in August or September um, Nina 
Yeah, August, I think. Super, yes. And thank you very much to Helen at Serif Press for all of her support also. Um, so we do have some really um, good questions. Thank you to everybody who's contributing to the chat this evening. And I wanted to um, break the ice by going first, if that's OK, to ask a question um, about the title of the book, Nina. It's a dual language title. Um, it's something that we discussed um, sort of throughout the editing process and the sort of coming together, the sort of concept of the book um, seem to be really importantly embedded within that title. So I wonder if you could say a little bit about how you finally arrived at the decision to go with um, the particular title of Magnolia Mulan. Yeah, sure. Um, it was actually really lovely to hear you call it that because I got gotten very used to other people just calling it Magnolia, which is also fine. I think that's also its title. So I love that it has like um, multiple names, I guess. Um, and I've also like taken to just calling it Magnolia, but um, yeah, of course the full title is Magnolia Mulan. Um, the characters say Mulan, which means Magnolia. Um, so it's a kind of mirrored title. Um, I love that it could be either or. Um, and I love that it's the meaning of it if you're not if you don't read Chinese, will kind of slowly be revealed through the poems. Um, how did we come up? I find this, I found finding a title for this collection really hard. And for ages, it, it was kind of titleless, or it had like three titles. Um, in the end, I, I think I did want Magnolia to be to be in the title and I had a really long one <laughs> but um in the end we kind of settled on something a little bit more complex than if it was just Magnolia um and I really like it I think an, a kind of alternate title for me is actually maybe the title of the central sequence of poems which is field notes on a downpour which could be another title for the book I think um, so I like that. Yeah. Thank you, Nina. It's always really interesting. I think titles have such great power. So it's always interesting in how, especially with debut titles, they kind of grow and encompass something about the poems. So it's been a really lovely process to have had those conversations over recent months with you. Um, and um, we've had got some really good questions um, coming in from our viewers on YouTube. So the first one I'm going to go to is a, a question from Claire Bogan, who asks, I would love to know more about how objects such as painting, such as the painting Nina referenced, inform and invite um, and inspire response through poetry. Um, yeah, I think I've very naturally seek out things um, like paintings or films or other pieces of writing um, that end up that end up bringing a poetic response from me. Um, maybe because when something like that painting by Agnes Martin affects me so much, um, a poem was kind of the only way that I could maybe process that at the time. So I like the idea that maybe um, my kind of relationship with art, with music even, and movies is very much tied up with poetry. Um, it's also a really useful way, like a, a prompt when I'm stuck um, to think of writing some kind of ekphrastic poem that will really help me. I think it's because thinking of it as a response, um, speaking back to something or to someone um, is such a useful starting point and can really take away some of the angst or like writer's block that might be there about like embarking on a poem, which can be like a horrible thing to try and do sometimes. Um, yeah, so it happens a lot with me, especially recently I've been working on poems about the artist and poet Teresa Hak Yong Cha and it's ended up being like a long sequence of these kind of responses, both in poems and prose to her like performance art and art 
artist books that she made. So um, yeah, I think art will be, always continue to be um, a source of inspiration for my poems. It's a really interesting jumping off point, isn't it? And I think so often art and film and culture and the things around us become a way of sort of becoming that almost that kind of spark that we need to sort of fire us into the rest of the poem um so it's really interesting the way that you use art within your work um and I think it ties with your your great visual ability to to draw so much um into the poems of of the visual world so I think it works beautifully um we have another question from nabs beauty 97 who asks I'd love to know how different the process was when publishing Magnolia Mulan compared to Tiny Moons how did you know what ideas and images worked better as poems rather than prose so just to mention as well you have um, a wonderful book out with the indomitable Emma Press who we very much admire here in the West Midlands as a a fantastic published fellow publisher um, called Tiny Moons, which is a food memoir, um, which has been doing really, really well. And um, we will pop up a link to Tiny Moons as well um, to point people towards that book also. Um, so that question about kind of what was the difference in that process really between the two books? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, the Emma Press, uh, Emma who runs it is amazing. And um, that book turned out really beautifully as well I don't have one with me but it's really gorgeous and um I think the difference in in terms of poetry versus prose that book um that actually came out as a kind of diary like a food diary that I was writing at the time when I was in Shanghai and then it, um I saw a call out that Emma posted for non-fiction like short non-fiction manuscripts so that's how it became something longer. I think I find writing about food easier in prose. There are food poems in Magnolia actually, but um, I'm finding that the topic of food um, is so kind of broad and knotty. So I, I find myself, and there's so much history and um, context, culture. So I do find myself writing more prose about food and the publishing process though was um in some ways kind of similar because I think the Emma Press has that same um like lovely small independent publisher feeling and everything's collaborative and so creative and um so much care was put into the design of it and with Tiny Moons I guess it was less about typesetting and more about the illustrations and yeah it's beautifully illustrated by Emma herself and so and that was new to me because I haven't published um like a, a book of prose before so that was really interesting and um both were great a great experience <laughs> yeah it's great Oh, thank you very much. And it's always lovely to to talk about the uh, the other books as well, because you've also been working on um, various other manuscripts over the recent months. And you've been incredibly busy with lots of projects, haven't you, as well, with the Nan Shepherd Prize. And mm. um, so it's it's brilliant that you've had such a great year in 2020 in terms of the, the work that you're producing and the new things that are coming out. And um, we're delighted to see Tiny Moon's doing well. And it is very beautifully illustrated. So I do urge anyone who um, is buying Magnolia to pop over to the Emma Press website and support them also. Um, one final question then from Jessica J. Lee, who asks, Nina, can you talk a little bit about how your work responds to landscape and place and how that differs from responding to other objects? Mm, thanks, Jessica. That's a big question. Um, I think I'm always jumping between different places. Magnolia, actually, the structure of it came about um, in a kind of uh, geographical way, which I really liked. So um, the first section are poems that were mostly all written the same time and place in Shanghai and the middle as well. But then the final section kind of jumps back to New Zealand where I was born and London where I live now. Um, so I think it's in both my poems and my essays, I'm always 
thinking about place and its connection to memory and how places change in our memory. Um, mm, in terms of responding to other objects like art, I think, I don't know, it runs through all my different kinds of writing. Whereas perhaps with film and art, I find myself turning to poems but the question of landscape and water and place, which I'm like always thinking about, dreaming about, that comes up inevitably in like whatever I'm working on, I think, <laughs> even if it's meant to be about something different. Um, yeah, it's a very big question, which I'm gonna to continue to think about and probably talk to you about, Jessica. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> It sounds like one of those questions that's really at the core of your work in lots yeah. of ways that you'll be coming back to. I think it's so important. I always think those things are almost like a sort of an anchor in a way that kind of roots everything else and brings you back to things. So it'll be interesting reading the poems that continue to explore that. Thank you to everybody for such wonderful questions. Thank you to my colleague, Angela Hicken, who's been looking after the chat tonight and um, helping us um, with the admin for the event. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to have one final poem from Nina, and then I'm going to invite back all our guests to applaud, and then the event will end. So I'm just going to say now um, a huge thanks to our audience for joining us. It has been absolutely wonderful to spend um, a quite a cold, wet and rainy July evening indoors with all of you celebrating the arrival of this wonderful book by Nina Mingya Pals, um, Magnolia Mulan, which we are so delighted to have published. A huge thank you to our wonderful guests, to J.G. Ying, to Pratusha, and to Victoria Adukwe Bully. It has been just wonderful to have you as our special guests this evening. Um, I'll bring you all back on screen and we will applaud and clap Nina at the end of the um, event, but I'll now ask Nina to read us one final poem. Thanks, Jane. Um, yeah, this has been lovely. Uh, it's felt very warm and intimate and really nice and very strange that we won't like get to hang out afterwards and I don't know, go somewhere, but that's fine. <laughs> we will at some point. Um, the last poem I'll read is actually again another kind of um, I would say responding to an artwork, but that artwork is an essay, which is one of my favorite pieces of writing, uh, an essay called Total Eclipse by Annie Dillard. And last Eclipse. She traveled alone. She crossed the mountains. She watched the landscape innocently. She supported her head on her fist. She felt strange birds in the trees. She touched an avalanche. She moved towards it. She waited without air. She sweated into the cold. She became volcanic. She heard the moon unhook from her teeth. She felt a piece of sun detach. She dissolved with blue light into orchards. She became a color never seen. She flooded all the valleys. She sensed the last sane moment approaching. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. I think I had myself on mute there. <laughs> um, the perils of Zoom. Um, just to thank you, Nina, for that wonderful reading. Um, we're all back in the room now, your guests and your host and you, and we're going to applaud you and say good night to everybody. Thank you, Nina. Thank you to our audience. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Nina. <laughs> thank you, all of you.